Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. So we now have Hannah Gutierrez's position on what sentence she should get for involuntary manslaughter in the death of Helena Hutchins. She doesn't even think she should get a criminal record. We're going to break this down, we're going to go through it, and we're also going to look at the government response, because the government does a pretty good job of poking some holes in it. Bowles also pulls some moves in this that I think are a little interesting. We're going to comment on them, because um, this was not the file to be careless on. Okay, let's have a look. All right. So, Defendant Hannah Gutierrez reads sentencing memorandum and request for conditional discharge. A conditional discharge will go through the sort of law on this. It's in their, their filings here. But it basically means she'd be put on probation, and if she successfully completes probation, she doesn't even get a criminal record. Hmm. So Hannah Gutierrez Reed, by and through her counsel of record, Jason Bowles and Monica L. Barreras, hereby submits her sentencing memorandum. A jury convicted Ms. Gutierrez Reed of involuntary manslaughter and acquitted her of tampering with evidence. She faces up to 18 months incarceration. This court has discretion to fashion a sentence which combines punishment with rehabilitation, supervision, and monitoring. At the time of the sentencing hearing, Ms. Gutierrez Reed will have spent just over a month in custody. In addition to the incarceration time, however, uh, Ms. Gutierrez Reed has endured and will continue to endure collateral consequences far harsher than most defendants ever must face. This is really. I think it's a bold move to pitch this, uh, or at least you gotta, they gotta make the argument, but you gotta be really careful and harsher than most defendants must ever must face. You gotta remember there's a dead body on this file. Um, Helena Hutchins is dead. So this is maybe the wrong time to make this kind of pitch, or at least you gotta be very careful about how you do it. This includes an almost unprecedented press response to a case in New Mexico where hardly a month has gone by in the past two years without some kind of reporting regarding the case. The jury voir dire was a prime example when virtually every person in the jury room raised their hand about having heard something about this case. This conviction and press deluge will forever impact her life going forward, including with job prospects and simply trying to lead a normal life again someday. That actually happens to just about everybody who gets a criminal record. You know, if you got caught dealing drugs once, you're going to have issues trying to build a normal life after that. It's, it's a whole thing. Because of the reporting and having your personal data and information leaked to the press, remember that. They're, they're flagging having her personal data and information leaked to the press here. Uh, keep that in mind as we get to the end, because... I have some thoughts. She has also received numerous threats, including death threats. Predictably, all of this has caused her great anxiety, fear, and depression. She has sought and attended counseling to address these issues at Mojave Mental Health Clinic. The only reason I know how to pronounce that is from the Fallout games. Days after this tragedy occurred, Ms. Gutierrez Reed wanted to express her deep sadness regarding this tragedy and the death of Helena to the Hutchins family. Legal proceedings and the looming investigation, however, made that impossible. Fair statement. Um, you can't go and say, hey, I'm sorry, because that will be taken as an admission of responsibility. So, okay, I get that. This is a reasonable thing to say. Um, this would also be the time to have her stand up and, and say those things. Though she exercised her constitutional right to a jury trial, it did not mean that she didn't and doesn't still feel incredibly saddened and heartbroken by what happened on that tragic day on the Rust set. We'll, we'll see some of that get, um, get addressed by the government later. The tragic series of events that unfolded that day destroyed and altered many people's lives, including Ms. Gutierrez Reed's. She's not the one people are going to be feeling sorry for, though. This court has the incredible responsibility of weighing that a death did occur that day with all the other relevant sentencing factors, including Ms. Gutierrez Reed's history and personal characteristics, her work, her mental health history, substance use, and trauma that she has endured in her young life. Fair. All of this is fair to say. Many of the attached letters detail these additional factors and provide the court a more holistic picture of the kind of person Ms. Gutierrez-Reed is. 
Following the jury verdict, counsel have received numerous unsolicited emails and calls from around the country and world from people expressing their support for Ms. Gutierrez Reed. Uh, I'm guessing there was also other emails and so forth, but you're not going to mention those and okay. We've been informed that people have mailed letters on their own to this court, and we ask that the court consider all the sentiments expressed in these letters, as well as in computing a reasonable sentence. Do you really want that? Because I'm guessing some of those letters, I mean, the court can't consider a letter written by some random person. I can't randomly write a letter with no involvement in the case and send, this is nuts. And... I mean, some people might have been sending letters that say Ms. Gutierrez deserves lots more jail. Okay, um, this is this is a weird statement. So yeah, that balances punishment with rehabilitation and the need for deterrence with the notion of fairness, including that Sarah Zachary received complete immunity and David Halls received six months of unsupervised probation on a misdemeanor. While Ms. Morrissey wasn't the one who reached the plea deal with Mr. Halls, it was still entered into by the state and prior prosecutors. Yeah, that's the benefit of a plea deal, is that you tend to get a better result. Um, that's, that's the risk of running things to trial. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed has been gainfully employed for the past 10 years. See, she was a social media marketing assistant for companies from 2022 to 2024. Within the movie industry before that, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed was armorer and props assistant in various films, including Rust in October 2021, as an armorer on The Old Way from August to September 2021, as armorer uh, on Murder at Yellowstone City in March 2021. I don't know if I would have wanted to use the murder word in this particular thing, but okay. Um, a vacation rental cleaner from 2019 to 2020, and an armorer on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in 2017. She was also on the set of Magnificent Seven in 2015, and at Rue 21 from 2014 to 2015. What is on the set? Like, was she working, or was she just, like, present? Because being present somewhere is not employment history, it's just that you were in a location. Um... She also has helped her dad, who was diagnosed with leukemia, and has helped care for him when he needs help with various things. Okay, that is a, a relevant thing, right? Several of the letters provide examples of her character, personal traits, and work ethic. And submitting character letters is, is proper and is reasonable. You just also have to be careful with character letters because the courts can pick them apart. And sometimes people trying to help out can actually cause problems because they can suggest issues. We're, we'll talk about that a little bit further. Uh, Sean Creedlebaugh Jr. is Ms. Gutierrez's boyfriend and has known her since she was little. Mr. Creedlebaugh states, she's always helping people and going out of her way to make sure people are okay. She's a part of her community and always working and taking care of her dad. Ms. Gutierrez's aunt states that she is kind and smart and the last person that should be in jail. Somebody's dead, though. Um, she also states that Ms. Gutierrez helps her mom at work and that uh, and that her dad and her and her dad, I'm guessing, have a close relationship. John Harper Felsch has been a friend of Ms. Gutierrez since 2016, and they've also lived together with other roommates. Mr. Felsch states in his letter to this court that Hannah would often be the first to welcome me into, an un or into uncomfortable social situations and highlight my character to make me feel more welcome. She fed me when I was hungry, when I had no money to purchase food for myself. That's a really good statement for, for this kind of thing. Rani Hutcherson, another friend of Ms. Gutierrez, states that throughout our friendship, Hannah is a source of unwavering support and encouragement during some of my darkest moments. Whether I was grappling with relationship challenges or battling depression, Hannah is always there to offer a listening ear, sage advice, and a comforting presence while living over 20 hours away now. So these are, for the most part, good letters, but you can see that they're quoting from them selectively. But these letters will be tendered, and then we can point to some of the... There's some issues with some of them, and there's some other issues going on. Joey Merrigan, Ms. Gutierrez's employer, states that Hannah demonstrated remarkable dedication, professionalism, and talent. She consistently produced high-quality work and demonstrated a small, a strong commitment to her responsibilities. Her creativity, attention to detail, and ability to effectively engage with our audience were invaluable assets to our team. 
attention to detail might not be the thing to highlight in a situation where her inattention to detail resulted in a death, but okay, um, you're stuck with what people write. Outside of her professional skills, I also had the opportunity to observe Hannah's personal qualities. She conducted herself with integrity, honesty, and reliability, earning the respect and trust of her colleagues and supervisors. Colleen Hart, who has known Ms. Gutierrez for eight years, states that Ms. Gutierrez has volunteered to help clean, sand, and repaint her neighbor's deck. She volunteered and helped raise money for a local veterans council that is not for profit. In my experience, she's a thoughtful and kind human. Okay, um, all good things. Kelsey Hill, another friend of Ms. Gutierrez, states that Hannah is a person of utmost integrity and moral character. Prosecution's gonna aim some guns at that. Uh, she has always strived to uphold the principles of honesty, compassion, and responsibility in all aspects of her life. The letters in totality paint a picture of Hannah being kind, helpful, hardworking, and a wonderful friend and daughter. Hopefully these letters provide the court with a fuller picture of her overall character from people who know her well. This is always a good thing to bring in when you're looking at sentencing on a serious file. I mean, you might not do it on like a shoplifting or something like that, but when you're dealing with a situation where somebody is at risk of getting a record who might not otherwise, or is at risk of a serious jail sentence, it's a good thing to have if available. Not everybody out there has people who will write letters like this. If you've been a, you know, if you've been a sort of career criminal for years, there may not be a whole lot of people who are willing to stand in your corner, but she's got people. That's a good thing. So sentencing law and request. New Mexico case law states that among the factors that may be considered when deciding a sentence are one, unusual aspects of the defendant's character, two, past conduct, age, health, any events surrounding the crime, three, pattern of conduct, indicating whether uh, he or she is a serious threat to society, and four, the possibility of rehabilitation. However, a trial court is not limited to those factors. The specifics of the crime and the characteristics of the defendant are relevant to the sentencing court's exercise of its discretion to sentence the defendant. Basically, you gotta, in sentencing, you've gotta say, how serious is this? Who is this person? Are they, are they dangerous? Are they, you know, are they somebody we can help? Like, is this the kind of person who needs a strong jail sentence? Is this somebody that maybe we should show mercy to? This is, uh, this is a, a difficult question, and it's always going to be somewhat individualized to the particular person. The sentencing judge must make a careful, independent evaluation of defendant's rehabilitative potential. And so, yeah, although the basic sentence is up to 18 months imprisonment, the court has discretion to grant a conditional discharge and to provide Ms. Gutierrez Reed an incentive to rehabilitate and comply with all requirements the court may impose on probation. A sentence of conditional discharge may be imposed under New Mexico uh, law, which provides that when a person who has not been previously convicted of a felony offense is found guilty of a crime for which a deferred or suspended sentence is authorized, the court may, without entering an adjudication of guilt, which means you know, they're not technically found guilty. They're just, it's a secondary, like they're bypassed from that. Enter a conditional discharge order and place the person on probation and terms and conditions authorized by the law. A conditional discharge order may only be available uh, once with respect to any person. So you only get one shot at this. You screw it up. There's no, uh, no second chances. If the person violates any of the conditions of probation, the court may enter an adjudication of guilt and proceed other, as otherwise provided by law. So um, when I say if you screw it up, I mean if you get a second conviction. But if you violate the conditions, the court has the option, not required, but has the option to say, you know how we said you weren't going to be adjudicated as guilty? We're undoing that. Now you go and now you get, to, now you get found guilty. So the legislation, uh, legislature enacted the conditional discharge statute as an alternative to a suspended or deferred sentence. A conditional discharge order may only be available once with respect to any person. It may be given for an array of first-time felony offenses, even those who are found guilty of a violent offense. And they give an example of, and whenever you're doing this, you're going to cite to examples of people who are um, similarly situated, so similar to your client. Um, who got what 
what you're proposing. So they cite uh, Trainin, where a conditional discharge was given for battery against a household member and two felony counts for intimidation of a witness and false imprisonment. In State uh, versus Lefevre, conditional discharge entered after a jury found him guilty of possession of methamphetamine. Another one given for negligent child abuse resulting in great bodily harm. Um, so I would have wanted to find one here that involved firearms and a death. That's what I really would have wanted if I was doing my case law research. Given that they don't have any on deaths, I think that they probably couldn't find one, is, is my guess. Ms. Gutierrez-Reed is eligible for a conditional discharge. She has a complete lack of prior criminal history. Um, prosecution's going to put a big old asterisk there. It is proper to consider her employment record. She has no prior convictions, is, is, is true, and that's important. Her employment record, record of prior good works, and positive things she has done when considering the sentencing option. Absolutely appropriate, and I agree with his submissions here. This is actually... Overall, this is well-written and well-argued. Um, I have criticized Bowles quite a bit. I'm going to criticize him a bit later. Overall, he's doing a good job here. And if he'd done this job when it was time to argue for um, for whether or not uh, Ms. Gutierrez should have been released pre, uh, pre-sentencing, she might have been out. He, he didn't, but I'm glad he's doing some good arguing now. So... The facts support a conditional discharge based on her lack of a criminal history, her personal character traits as expressed in the outpouring of letters from the community, and her relative youth and the devastating effect a felony will have on her life going forward. A conditional discharge will require Ms. Gutierrez uh, Reed to abide by all set conditions during any term of a probationary period and to undergo all counseling and rehabilitative efforts this court requires. Considering all the circumstances and the sentencing factors, including the history and characteristics of Ms. Gutierrez Reed, as further set forth in this series of letters presented to this court, the proposed conditional discharge is warranted. A sentence with some period of incarceration, followed by a term of probation, to, is adequate to punish the offense, but not more serious uh, than necessary to serve the underlying sentencing goals. Um, okay. This is a weird jump. Um, cause I don't, can they combine incarceration with, with that? Um, so the punishment also furthers the basic purposes of criminal punishment, deterrence, incapacitation, just punishment and rehabilitation. That seems weird because they're saying a sentence with some period of incarceration. Um, does that, is that allowed along with that? Cause, uh, hmm. This seems like they're proposing an alternate sentence, although they're being a little confusing about doing it. Sometimes you will tell the court, you know, what I mean by an alternate sentence is that sometimes you'll tell the court, here's the sentence we think is appropriate. Like, my client doesn't go to jail. But if you think that the that my client should go to jail, here's what we think that should look like. And so you have that sort of fallback position. You can do that. That's That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. The other thing I really would have liked to have seen him put in here is always make things easy for the court and do your homework because if you don't present a full sentencing position to the court, the court thinks you don't care about or you don't agree with your own position. So when you're proposing bail, you should be ready to propose bail on specific terms with specific conditions. Here, they just say, to abide by all set conditions during any uh, term of, pro of a probationary period and to undergo all counseling and rehabilitative efforts this court requires. Okay, um, what conditions are you proposing? What conditions would you say are appropriate? I would have wanted, like, if this was me, I would have said, here is our proposal for sentencing. It should be this term. The conditions we suggest are this condition, this condition, this condition, along with any others that the court finds appropriate or necessary. Ideally, what you want is for the court to basically be able to select your sentencing position, hit control C on the keyboard, go over to their decision and hit control V and drop it in. 
You want them to be able to just read from your document what the, the proper sentence is going to be. When you're a defense lawyer, you've got to, um, you know, you've got to make it easy on the court because you've, you've usually got an uphill battle. And in this case, they've got a very uphill battle um, because they're trying to, you know, they're trying to deal with a death and they're asking for a conditional discharge or a conditional, uh, yeah. So, hmm, yeah, it's, it's tough. Okay, so let's have a look at these letters. Um, because, hmm, yeah. So first we've got Sean Creedlebaugh and, yeah, Hannah's character letter. And he's emailing, uh, Carmela, uh, that's the... That's the assistant. Hello there, my name is Sean Creedlebaugh Jr. and I am Hannah Gutierrez's boyfriend. I've known Hannah since we were kids and she's always been a great caring person, loved by everyone that truly knows her. She's always helping people and going out of her way to make sure people are okay. Mm, okay, um, moving on. She's a part of her community and always working and taking care of her dad. She's helped me this past couple of years to open up and not just push everyone away. She's an amazing person that the media is painting a bad picture about. To say she isn't remorseful would be an understatement. Um, this is this is where you send this back and say, I, I think that you might have a typo. To say she isn't remorseful would be an understatement. I'm guessing he means the opposite of that and that it was just an error, but... Um, you're like, no, you, is this what you meant to say? Because if this is wrong, you should correct it. And if you're the lawyer, you should be checking these letters and going, I'm pretty sure this is just a typo. You can't tell people what to say, but it isn't inappropriate to go, I think this might be a mistake, an actual error. Like, so these past few years have been the hardest for her mentally with not only Ms. Hutchins' death, but all the harassment and threats she gets from the case being highly public and the release of her personal information. Brackets. Don't know how that's legal. Well, um, nobody redacted it, and that was, like, Bowles' job. So, yeah. She understands that Ms. Hutchins' family will never get her back, and she cries constantly for them. Also, you don't want people taking shots at the court or the process in all of this. This is not the time. Not at all the time. Um, she understands that Ms. Hutchins' family will never get her back, and she cries constantly for them. I know for sure that she's remorseful every day, all day and night, dreaming about it and all. All the trauma, I'm sure. Her being incarcerated will impact her taking care of her father at home with cancer. Not asking you to let her off, just asking for a more lenient sentence of house arrest, probation, fines, and community service, or something. Thank you for taking the time to read my letter. Bless you. And then sort of signing it in email form. Okay. The next one, um, I can't really read because I can't solve this CAPTCHA. I am apparently a robot. Um, it says I'm Hannah's aunt by marriage and um some stuff um hannah has always been polite and respectful to me yeah um we're just not going to get this one he he does this with a few of them where they come through as completely unreadable um yeah now this is where i was gonna i said bowls did some things that i wouldn't have done and this is right here because those black bars are not on the official court filing. If you go on the, the court website, you can get this without the black bars. I'm just not doing that, and I don't encourage anyone else to. I'm just pointing this out, because he filed this unredacted. And he criticizes that Hannah has been subject to, you know, people contacting her and harassing her and criticizes the release of that. And then he is careless with the information of these witnesses such that like there's home addresses in this, there's phone numbers, there's email addresses, bowls. What the heck are you doing? I don't think anyone would have objected if you had filed these with redactions because, oh, and if you were worried that somebody might've objected, I would have made an application to the court. I'm sure that 
Carrie Morrissey, the prosecutor, would have agreed to redact out these in these details because nobody needs this information. Why are you putting this in the public record bowls? And it undercuts his own point, seriously undercuts his own point when he's saying Hannah was the subject of harassment and threats and so forth because of the leaking of, inf of her information. And then he goes and leaks the information of all of these witnesses. I, and also, it is possible to find their information. Do not reach out to them. Do not contact them. Do not message them. Do not think about them. Do not any of this stuff. Mm, this should not have happened. Um, be careful with what you're putting into the public record. So, um, the letter itself. To whom it may concern, my name is John Harper Felsch. I'm a resident of Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, we're not narrowing it down too far. I attended Northern Arizona University and graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer engineering. I have been a friend of Hannah Gutierrez since around 2016 when we met through mutual friends. I went on to live with Hannah and several other roommates for about two years, starting in 2017 through 2020. I am writing this letter on behalf of Hannah. While I respect the judicial ruling in the case, I would like to shed light on the kind of person that Hannah has been to me as a friend. You always want people to have respect for the ruling in the case because um, if they start taking shots at the decision, it sounds like a lack of remorse on the part of the person who the letter is being submitted for. Even though it's another person writing it, it's still not great. So... Yeah. Hannah would be would often be the first to welcome me into uncomfortable social situations and highlight my character to make me feel more welcome. She's fed me when I was hungry, when I had no money to purchase food for myself. She's been he's got a degree in computer engineering. Huh. I I would have thought he's would have been doing doing okay. Okay. She's been a shoulder to cry on in my darker moments. She's helped me find a sense of belonging and pride that I desperately needed at that time in my life. Her sense of humor helped alleviate the pain of events unfolding around me. Living with her was a joy that I'm grateful to have experienced. I've always valued Hannah as a friend, and the circumstances of this situation are deeply saddening and confounding. I would like to thank the court for their willingness to hear my plea. I would like to ask that the court only attribute the minimal sentencing to her case. Hannah does not have malicious intention, and while I recognize that the events of October 21st uh, resulted in the death Helena Hutchins, there's a missing word, but whatever, with my serious condol sincerest condolence, I would like to ask the court to consider Hannah's humanity and that she did not mean to hurt anybody. And while there is a price to pay, she's a good person in my eyes and heart. This is an excellent letter. This is an excellent letter. The only fault I have is on bowls for not redacting it. Great letter. Um, this is a good guy to have in your corner. And it sounds like Hannah has been a good person to him. This is an excellent letter. Good work. Um, next, we have Ranny Hutcherson, to whom it may concern. My name is Ranny Hutcherson. I am currently the general manager of, and this is again, not redacted in the original, but nobody needs to go to a store because it's mentioned in the thing. However, I met Hannah Gutierrez-Reed through a work colleague during my transition out of college and into a management position at another establishment. We've been close friends for five years. When first meeting Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, she was still in college studying film. Her passion for the industry radiated when she spoke about her future career and the opportunities she saw. Throughout our friendship, Hannah is a source of unwavering support and encouragement during some of my darkest moments. Whether I was grappling with relationship challenges or battling depression, Hannah is always there to offer a listening ear, sage advice, and comforting presence while living over 20 hours away now. Her ability to connect with people on a personal level when they first meet is a testament to who she is as a person. We have not lived together in over four years, but never once have I slipped through the cracks of friendship like most do with distance and time. I gotta call some of my friends. Um, this is making me uh, this is making me kind of sentimental, which is good. It's it's good. This is what you want in these letters. Unfortunately, Hannah has found herself under intense scrutiny by the media, which has painted an inaccurate and unfair portrayal of her character. This is where I start going, danger. Because this is about Hannah, but not about how Hannah is, is wronged here. So the inaccurate and unfair portrayal is, is a fair thing to say. I'm just, I'm starting to raise danger flags about whether this might 
veer into areas where I, as defense, you know, as a defense lawyer, would not want it to go. So, as someone who has witnessed her actions and interactions firsthand, I can confidently say that the image presented by the media does not align with the Hannah I know. While I wasn't with her every day during the last few years, I was there to support her during this trying time. Rather than allowing herself to be consumed by negativity, she is focused on staying true to herself and maintaining her integrity. It is my understanding that Hannah has cooperated fully with authorities investigating the incident and has expressed profound remorse for the loss of life that occurred. I believe that she is genuinely remorseful and that this tragedy has left an indelible mark on Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. In light of these considerations, I respectfully urge the court to take into account Hannah's character, her lack of prior offenses, and her cooperation with the investigation when sentencing the case. While the consequences of the incident are irreversible, I hope the court will recognize that Hannah is a young woman who made a mistake in the course of performing her duties rather than someone who acted with malicious intent. This is also a very good letter. Um, I like this letter. It's an excellent letter for support. Uh, there was a place where I was like, where are they going with this? They steer away. Excellent. Good. All right. So the next one we have is from Joey Merrigan. Your Honor, I am writing to provide a character reference for Hannah, who I've had the privilege of knowing in a professional capacity as her employer. If you're ever in trouble and you have bosses that you left on good terms with, they're a great person to write to ask for help, so long as they like you. While I regret the circumstances that have led to her current situation, I feel compelled to share my perspective on her character based on my interactions with her. As the social media manager for Mike and my furniture store, it's listed, but again, it shouldn't have been, Hannah demonstrated remarkable dedication, professionalism, and talent. She consistently produced high-quality work and displayed a strong commitment to her responsibilities. Her creativity, attention to detail, and ability to effectively engage with our audience were invaluable assets to our team. Attention to detail is... Uh, it's one of those things that make me go, hmm? and may make the court do the same thing. Outside of her professional skills, I also had the opportunity to observe Hannah's personal qualities. She conducted herself with integrity, honesty, and reliability, earning the respect and trust of her colleagues and supervisors. Despite the challenges she may be facing, I believe that Hannah possesses the resilience and determination to overcome them. While I cannot speak to the specifics of Hannah's current situation, I can attest to her positive character traits and her potential for rehabilitation and contribution to society. I sincerely hope that Your Honor will take into consideration the person beyond the circumstances and offer any appropriate leniency or support that may be warranted. Should you require further information or clarification, please do not hesitate to contact me, respectfully, Joey Merrigan, and his phone number, which I have redacted, because, again, why would they put this into the public record? Don't put it into the pub... Hmm. Okay. Colleen Hart! and like her home address i think so that was redacted as there um honorable judge summer my name is colleen hart my occupation is hr manager for a cabinet company in kingman arizona i've known hannah gutierrez reed for eight years i met her through her childhood best friend i consider hannah to be extended family and a loyal friend i've known hannah to be hardworking, creative and artistic she put herself through college and never gave up on her dreams when she traveled home from Flagstaff, Arizona, she would always call to see if I were available for coffee or just to say hello. Some kids in their mid-twenties would not take the time to check in with an older friend. In December of 2022, Hannah was coming through town and wanted to have coffee. She found out my husband and I both had COVID-19. She checked on me and my husband regularly while we were extremely ill for two weeks. She's volunteered to help clean, sand, and repaint her neighbor's deck. She volunteered and helped raise money for a local veterans council that is not for profit. In my experience, she is a thoughtful and kind human. Hannah is remorseful and understands the gravity of that fateful day in New Mexico. Her spunky attitude and excitement for the future has been dimmed. She's working on improving her life and that of those around her. When determining her sentence, please consider this plea for the court to consider a rehabilitative approach rather than solely punitive measures. My hope is that Hannah will receive the tools to move forward through counseling and therapy if she is to remain incarcerated. I believe in the power of redemption, and it is my hope you take these points into account during sentencing. Also a great letter. Only complaint is that I had to redact this, and Bowles should have redacted it. We're going to get into some letters that um, 
that have some problems with them. Your Honor, I am writing to provide a character statement for Hannah Gutierrez Reed, whom I have known for over six years and have considered a good friend the last four while I resided in Bullhead City, Arizona, where my family and I spent a significant amount of time with her. Hannah has been wrongfully convicted of involuntary manslaughter. This is a bad letter. Do not tell the court that your client has been wrong. Like, if she's accepting the verdict of the court, okay. But, you know, this kind of thing where you get a letter that says that she was wrongfully convicted, if you disagree with the verdict, just leave it out. Um, it can turn a judge away from you. It can cause problems and it can cause the judge to say, I am not going to consider the rest of this letter because clearly this is not somebody who understands the gravity of the situation. Throughout this ordeal, I have witnessed firsthand the impact of media sensationalism and public scrutiny on her life. Hannah is a person of utmost integrity and moral character. She's always strived to uphold the principles of honesty, compassion, and responsibility in all aspects of her life. Despite the wrongful accusations and intense media scrutiny, she's remained steadfast in maintaining her integrity and dignity. It is evident that the media's portrayal of this case has been sensationalized and biased, leading to a rush to judgment and the wrongful conviction of an innocent individual. The relentless media attention and public pressure have created an unjust environment that has further compounded the tragedy of this situation. Throughout this ordeal, Hannah has shown remarkable resilience and courage. Despite facing unjust accusations and the loss of her freedom and privacy, she has maintained a positive outlook and a strong belief in the truth. Her unwavering determination to seek justice and clear her name is a testament to her character. I urge the court to consider the mitigating factors in this case, including the undue influence of media sensationalism, and to grant the minimum sentence possible under the circumstances. Hannah has already suffered immeasurable harm as a result of this wrongful conviction. Um... So is Helena, though. <laughs> like, and it is imperative that she be given the opportunity to reclaim her life and reputation. Thank you for considering my statement. This statement is not a good statement. This statement is um, may not be super helpful. And now we have another CAPTCHA. This one is a little easier to read. Um... I'm writing this because of the concern that I have for a dear friend of mine that has been determined to be guilty of a serious crime. I've known Hannah for several years and I'm very worried about her. She's very young and I'm sure found it very difficult to give orders to a much older actor that has years of experience and very set in his ways. I partied with her multiple times and have never known her to be out of control or never was aware of any behavior unbecoming to her. I have a lot of respect for Hannah since the incident when she came back home to Bullhead City she had a place of her own, had a job, and didn't hang her head and expect pity. Now, of course, she's back home being a caregiver to her ill father, still working from home with another job. She's a very motivated young lady and a hard worker. She hasn't depended on her family and is a very determined gal to be independent. I'm hoping and praying the court will consider, take into consideration, uh, or take into all considerations of this case. Um, this is a, a good letter. Uh, again, I had to redact a whole bunch of things there, and yeah. Beverly Cotton, whose information I also had to redact. To whom it may concern, my name is Beverly Cotton, and I am Hannah Gutierrez Reed's extra mom. I've known her since before she started high school. Not too long after she came into my life. Um, so is this... Is this the mom that was in court? Um, I'm, I'm wondering which one. Uh... Not too long after she came into my life, she's friends with my daughter, I quickly became her extra mom. I loved who she was and how she handled herself. She stood up for what she believed in. I don't think it was her in court. Uh, didn't care what other people thought about her and didn't give in to peer pressure when other people told her how she should be. Um, maybe she should have if she was giving in to peer pressure about people telling her she should be safe. Um, and also her argument was that she was giving in to peer pressure from Alec Baldwin. So I, okay. Then I got to know her on a deeper level where I got to know her heart and fell in love with her as a person. She comes to all of our family gatherings and has been doing so for over 10 years. Hannah has such a big heart. She makes time for all her families, which includes all of her friends' families too, in Bullhead on the holidays to spend time with them. She has multiple that she goes to. Hannah always brings something. Normally it is her specialty, deviled eggs and they're so good everyone looks forward to them. 
She spends quality time with everyone and always helps clean up afterwards. Her soul is beautiful. She's done Christmas morning with us for many years. Her daughter and her are now sisters, and I believe soulmates. I believe the just, or I respect the justice system and the jury verdict. I wanted to write uh, you to let you know the personal side of Hannah and how this has affected her life. This is a very good letter so far. Uh, I talked to Hannah on the date of the incident, and she was so upset that something like this had happened, and she was in complete disbelief. When she found out Helena Hutchins died, a part of Hannah left with her. Hannah greatly admired Helena as a person and for the job she did, because she was not only an amazing cinematographer, and that is what Hannah aspired to be, but she was also an amazing person in Hannah's opinion. She is very remorseful of everything that happened and the part she played in this tragedy. We have had many conversations about it. Hannah went to four years of college in North, uh, North Arizona University to work in the movie industry. The tragedy has completely changed her life in so many ways, and she no longer work, wants to work for the movie industry. Whether or not she could, or, or whether she could or not after this, she couldn't. I don't think they'd let her onto a movie set. She had decided she wasn't going back. She's now trying to figure out uh, what to do with her life since that's all she wanted to do for a career. She wanted to do so much more than just be an armorer. I'm asking for time served and probation. Um, they don't really get to ask for specifics, but fair enough. Um, the rest of that is fine. Um, I am available to confirm the facts in this letter as necessary. And then we have um, another letter here from uh, Donna K. Cotton. My name is Donna K. Cotton, and I am 60 years old. I am writing this letter to tell you about the person Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is and how this tragedy has changed her. I have known Hannah Gutierrez-Reed for over 10 years. When I first met her, she was a junior in high school. Since that time, I've watched her grow up, and I'm proud of the person that she has become. She's always been the person or that would give the shirt off her back if there was someone that needed it more than she did, and I have watched her go above and beyond to help friends and strangers alike. She is part of a core group of friends of my daughter and is part of our family. She attended North Arizona University for four years and majored in film and television. Her plan was to become a cinematographer and producer. When she was hired onto Rust, she was so excited to be working with Helena Hutchins because she admired her work. I've spoken to Hannah many times since that tragic day in October of 2021. The events of that day have changed Hannah to her core. She made a decision immediately to never return to the film industry not only as an armor, but in all aspects of the film industry. This was an extremely difficult decision for her because her education and work experience is all in the film industry. In 2022, Hannah's been working very hard to create a business in marketing by doing social media advertising here local in Bullhead City, Arizona. I am proud of the difficult decision she made to leave the film industry and of the effort she's putting into creating and building her business. She's extremely remorseful for what happened to Lena and Joel and her part in the tragedy. She has told me many times, I wish I checked them better. Now, we're going to see some things with the prosecution. Who's going to have a response to this? These are good letters overall. And I can tell you this is expanding my vision, like my understanding of who Helena, or sorry, who Hannah is as a person. This is good, right? Um, this is deserving of some compassion. So during the trial, the prosecution said that Hannah only cared about her career ending. Please know that Hannah cared deeply about the status of Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza and asked continuously about their status. When she found out that Helena passed away, she was crushed. Just two years prior, Hannah's boyfriend died in a motorcycle accident and all she could think about was Helena's husband and son and the pain they would suffer as a result of her loss. Hannah was offered a plea deal by the district attorney prior to the trial. This should not be going before the court. Uh, she and I discussed whether she should take the plea or go through the jury trial. This should probably have been left out entirely. She tried to have her attorney amend the plea by removing the item stating that Hannah brought the live rounds on set. Since she did not bring them on set and did not know how they got there, Hannah did not feel right in taking the plea deal and lying to the court. In our discussions, I told her that uh, I told her that I don't believe I would have made the same decision. I would have taken the easy way out and taken the plea. Her response was, I just can't lie to the court and I will put my fate in the hands of the jury. I know Hannah is not a danger to society, nor will she ever work with guns again. You know what? She probably isn't a danger to society so long as she doesn't work with guns again, but we're going to put an asterisk on that. Um, we're going to come back to this in the, or in the state's response here. 
With these thoughts in mind, I am requesting time served and probation in this case. If you have any questions about the contents of this letter or need clarification, please do not hesitate to contact me at the number below, which they put into the public record. And you, as a viewer, should hesitate to contact her. <laughs> do not contact them. Even though Bowles made it possible, do not do it. Um, Jerry Cotton. Hello, my name is Jerry Cotton, and I am co-owner of Redacted. Uh, and also Hannah Gutierrez's closest friend. We played softball together as young kids and became best friends around the summer of 2015. Hannah's shown me what a true friend really is and proven the definition of loyalty to me and others countless times. It's almost impossible to put nine years of unconditional support into words. Since I met Hannah, she's always been the person who takes the high road and never let others influence her own decisions. Which is bad, because that was part of their argument at trial, is that she was getting bullied by others. Even with all the hardships life has thrown at her, her fiancé dying in a motorcycle wreck, losing her place to live, her dog passing away, her stepfather developing leukemia, the rust incident, and much, much more, she's never let it destroy the outgoing and loving person she truly is. No matter what she's going through, she makes it important to also be the supportive, uh, to always be the supportive friends to those in need. When my father died in March of 2022, in the middle of Hannah dealing with her own personal struggles, she did not let me go through it alone. She stayed right by my side countless nights while I cried and screamed at the world. She made sure I never felt alone and was never physically alone either. This wasn't the first time she showed loyalty and real friendship either. In September of 2016, my grandfather, who I lived with, was in a motorcycle accident that left him in a coma for months. Hannah did not hesitate to come stay with me any time my household was empty, and she made the trip back and forth to Vegas with me to visit him in the hospital more times than I can count. Hannah has always been a big support system to a lot of people in our small town, helping house and dog sit for friends when needed, and also helping out making sure my niece had a ride to and from school if her father had to work. She has supported all local bands and went to every show she was able to, as well as doing many community service events with her current place of employment, Mattress Land. Um... Okay, I, I left that one out, but I missed that one. But yeah, it's mattress. <laughs> okay, as I respect the justice system and understand the jury's verdict, I am writing to give you some insight as to who this woman really is. She comes from a small town where success is rare, but she never let that stop her from trying. I've been by Hannah's side since the date of the rush shooting, and I spoke to her on the date it happened, and she was completely distraught and immediately wished she could have changed what happened on that day. October 21st, 2021 completely changed her life and she feels remorse every single day. The prosecution's going to have some thoughts about her level of remorse. We'll, we'll see that. I hope you take into consideration everything I've said when determining her sentencing along with time served and possibly probation if end of sentence. So thank you for taking the time to read this letter. I'm available to confirm any facts. Um, and then we have another captcha that I'm not even going to try. And the last one here, to the court system. Hannah is good and pure. I can't believe she is in jail. Her composure and strength during this, I'll never forget. You got the wrong person in custody. That's all I have to say. I can tell you this letter, I just wouldn't have included. Like, this letter just is is trash. Um, it, it's a bad letter. Um, so, all right. That's their thing. And I'm going to say it's overall very good. There are some mistakes that I think were made. Um, some of those letters, a couple of them I wouldn't have included. But overall, um, overall, they're they're very positive. This is very helpful. I think that defense has done a, a good job overall. Um, I have some criticisms. There's always some criticisms. Everybody, you know, when you're... But overall, it's it's not bad. Um, overall, he's doing his best for his client. I don't think he's going to get the conditional discharge, but he did some, some good work. And then we're going to see the prosecution who has some thoughts and who comes now like a wrecking ball. <laughs> so I, I hate the comes now. I, I just hate it. Um, it is a peeve of mine and will continue to be a peeve. State's response to defendant's sentencing memorandum and request for conditional discharge. So comes now the state of New Mexico by and through special prosecutors Kerry T. Morrissey and Jason J. Lewis, who doesn't get as much headlines, but has also been doing good work on this file, 
who submit the following in response to the defendant's sentencing memorandum and conditional discharge. The state opposes the defendant's request for a conditional discharge. They don't want that. Um, in fact, they're going to be pitching hard for lots of jail, as much jail as possible. While it is true that Ms. Gutierrez is eligible for a conditional discharge, they mean that legally she can apply for one. That they're agreeing with that principle that legally um, she's not forbidden from a conditional discharge. The state asserts that Ms. Gutierrez should not be granted a conditional discharge because upon her arrival in New Mexico, she swiftly committed a host of felonies and has another felony charge pending before Judge Ellington for intentionally hiding a firearm from security at a local bar to get the firearm into the bar. This is her other charge, and it's a serious charge, and of course the prosecution's going to mention it when you've got this, all of these letters going, she's such a great person of integrity and honesty. Hmm. Is it honest to smuggle a firearm into a bar? Is, yeah. Upon successfully circumventing the security at the bar, she went into the restroom and made a selfie video stating, they checked my purse, but they didn't check my butt cheeks. Wah, wah, wah. At the same time that she was speaking, she held up a nickel-plated semi-automatic pistol in front of the camera. The best evidence for Hannah Gutierrez is all of her friends who clearly love her and respect her tremendously, and that is to her credit. The best evidence against Hannah on sentencing is coming from Hannah herself, who unfortunately is doing her best to prove her friends to be misinformed. Um, this is not going to be a great look. There's additional evidence that has been, or that has previously been presented uh, to the court, that Ms. Gutierrez was in possession of cocaine while in New Mexico, and while working as the firearms expert on the set of Rust, yet another felony. The state also opposes a conditional discharge due to Ms. Gutierrez's complete and total failure to accept responsibility for her actions, as demonstrated by the summaries below of some of her calls since her incarceration on March 6, 2024. Um, I want to hear those calls. <laughs> I hope they play them. Ms. Gutierrez continues to deny responsibility and blame others. She goes so far as to blame the set medic, the paramedics who attempted to save Ms. Hutchins, and even blames the child actor on set, for picking up a gun. Moreover, there are references to Ms. Gutierrez being in possession of alcohol during the time that the trial was taking place and continuing to consume alcohol contrary to her conditions of release while on pretrial release with her boyfriend. She's been such a good... And this is the thing. They want to put her on conditions and they're saying she's a really good candidate to be on conditions. And now here they're saying she didn't even follow the conditions beforehand, so do you think that's appropriate now? Stunningly, Ms. Gutierrez requested during jail calls that her legal team request that Ms. Hutchins' husband and son be contacted and asked to speak on her behalf at her sentencing. Holy crap, no. Um, but I do have some questions about how she's getting, like, there's going to be some issues about the jail calls with her legal team. That's that's an issue. So we'll talk about that too. She continued to complain in her jail calls about the negative effects this incident has had on her life and her modeling career while never expressing genuine remorse at any time. She expressed a willingness to violate future court orders should she be subpoenaed for the Baldwin trial, which again suggests that she would not be a good candidate for... Uh, for any sort of conditional discharge or really probation in general. She referred to the jurors as, and pardon, this is her language, I'm just quoting, uh, retards, idiots, and assholes, and suggested that her mother could confront undersigned counsel in the restroom because counsel uses the same restroom as the public. Um, that would be a very serious crime. Finally, she suggested that her employment history be misrepresented to undersigned counsel and the court so it appears as though she was working full-time prior to the trial. Surprisingly, Ms. Gutierrez doesn't seem to mind being in jail, and at times appears to genuinely enjoy it. The state further requests that this court designate Ms. Gutierrez's offense a serious violent offense pursuant to New Mexico law. 
The amount of deductions a prisoner may earn depends on whether the crime for which the prisoner is serving his or her sentence is a serious violent offense or a non-violent offense. So this is what I was saying that uh, that Carrie Morrissey is, ac is actually asking for the most jail she can. We're, I'm going to explain this as we go. We're going to see what she's saying and I'm going to explain it. A prisoner serving a sentence for a serious violent offense may only receive up to four days per month of deductions, whereas a prisoner serving a sentence for a non-violent offense may receive up to 30 days per month of deductions. So, um, she's saying essentially that she should be getting less credit for the time, you know, that she's been spending. So, four days per month instead of 30 days per month. That means this suggests that Carrie Morrissey is going to be asking for the most jail time she can. So 17 crimes enumerated in 14 statutory provisions are by definition serious violent offenses. So those are per se violent offenses. Another 20 crimes enumerated in 15 statutory provisions are serious violent offenses if the district court finds that the nature of the offense and the resulting harm of the crime under a given set of facts warrant the designation. And... Uh, so this, there's an example that the district court must find that the crime was committed in a physically violent manner, either with an intent to do serious harm or, and they emphasize this, with recklessness in the face of knowledge that one's acts are reasonably likely to result in serious harm. The state is requesting the serious violent uh, offense designation due to the extreme recklessness with which Ms., uh, Mr., it should be Ms., uh, Gutierrez behaved while well working as the armor on the set of Rust. It is clear from the digital evidence presented at Ms. Gutierrez's trial that she brought live rounds on set by failing to properly inspect the dummy rounds she provided to the set. Moreover, she failed to check the dummy rounds after providing them to the set and as a result loaded one into the gun holster being worn by Alec Baldwin and the gun belt being worn by Jensen Eccles. She did all of this before she loaded a live round into a prop gun, told the first assistant director that the gun was cold, and permitted it to be handed off to an actor to manipulate for a scene. Every time a gun was loaded with dummy rounds, it was a game of Russian roulette. There's ample evidence that Ms. Gutierrez was using alcohol, marijuana, and cocaine in the evenings during the filming of Rust, and may have reported to set to work while uh, under the influence of these substances. It should be noted that on September 3rd, 2021, Mr. Gutierrez, again, Ms. Gutierrez's stepfather, Thel Reed, texted her, uh, did you find 45 Colt ammo? And then again texted, keep looking. This text from Ms. Gutierrez's stepfather was not used during trial because neither Ms. Gutierrez nor her stepfather testified. This message is a clear indication that Ms. Gutierrez was attempting to obtain 45 caliber ammunition in the weeks leading up to her work on the set of Rust. Ms. Gutierrez was aware that the guns being used by the actors on set were real guns and also knew that dummy rounds look exactly like live rounds. She certainly understood that she was responsible for checking the dummy rounds to ensure that they were inert and understood that people could be killed if a live round was placed into a prop gun. The state requests that Ms. Gutierrez be sentenced to 18 months in the Department of Correction, so the maximum, with a designation of serious violent offender due to her recklessness in the face of knowledge that her acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. Should the court... So you see, she's presenting the sentence she wants, right? Should the court determine that a suspended or deferred sentence is appropriate, the state requests that the court exercise its full probationary discretion and sentence Ms. Gutierrez to five years of probation as a condition of any suspended or deferred sentence. And now we're going to get into summaries of jail calls. And you see, she also does the alternative. If you think probation is appropriate, we want five years of probation. Um, and Ms. Gutierrez might actually get into more trouble with the five years of probation because if somebody's not going to follow probation and you put them on probation, they can get repeated breaches as they go. So, Hannah says that the other girls in jail were saying that, I can't believe they threw your pretty little white ass in here for nothing. Hannah says, like, yeah, girl, for real. She says that so far she's built for jail and likes tap water. She likes hard beds. The cat food isn't too bad every day. The male says that when Hannah was taken away, that mom said, this is some bullshit. Hannah laughs loudly. He tells her what mom did, and Hannah says she was glad her mom stood up and said something. 
Hannah laughs about all of this. The male says he's been to jail before. She says she didn't think she would like it, but now she does. So she likes jail. Now, if I'm defense counsel on this, I am spinning it that the only way you can like jail is if you're doing well in jail, if you're not picking fights, if you're not, you know, these kinds of things. And that if she's doing well in jail, it means that that she's behaving responsibly while there. That's how I would try to spin this, because you got to try something. Hannah says that she can't believe that the judge put her in jail. Hannah talks about the jury and how they only took two fucking hours and how she got the book thrown at her. She says that everyone lied on the stand except for two or three experts. This does not sound like somebody who's taking responsibility and showing remorse. She talks about the witnesses and how they all lied. And here's the worst of it um, for, for remorse. She says that she didn't need to be shaking all the dummies all the time. Yeah. She complains about what happened on set and says people are still going to die on set. She complains about Gabby Pickle. She complains about the jury and how people who got immunity and had pending lawsuits. See, she says she wishes TMZ would shut up and that she literally, or literally, she is fine. She complains about the Washington Post and how if they talk to any worker in there, they would all say she's happy and bubbly. Maybe she is. She talks about being a felon and how it's going to work with all of his guns and how she isn't sure how it will work. She says that he can put them in a safe and he can tell them that she doesn't know the combo. Here's the problem. If she's a felon, she's not allowed, she's not allowed guns. Thel Reed owns guns because of course he does. He's a famous gunslinger, like literally a legendary gunslinger. So, um, I have no problem with the notion of he puts them in a safe and she doesn't know the combination. I have a problem if her notion is she puts them or he puts them in a safe and she tells them that she doesn't know the combination because that implies that she still knows the combination, which would make her a felon in possession of firearms and might make Thel Reed in some trouble as well. Um, now here's the problem. We have a summary of this and I want to hear the original because does she say, tell them that she doesn't know the combination or does she say he can put them in a safe and she wouldn't know the combination? Okay. She talks about how she's wrongly incarcerated. After Hannah was taken into custody, Hayden, the other party to the call, goes to her hotel room to clean up, and Sean says, where did this bottle of Crown Royale come from? Hayden claims it, and Sean, uh, and says Sean wasn't thrilled. Um, so this is the, because this is after she's taken into custody while she's, you know, pending her sentencing, right? And they're cleaning up her room, and there's Crown Royal, and... Why is there booze in her hotel room if she's not allowed booze? So, Hannah talks about playing games with the other inmates. Hannah says she's fine in there. Hannah talks about suing various media outlets. Hannah goes back to TMZ and how she is built for jail. Hannah says that if she's subpoenaed, so this I got no problem with as defense counsel. I'm like, cool. Um, same with, you know, this fine in jail. I'd be like, okay, it shows she's adapting well. It shows that she's following rules. Because if she's not following the rules in custody, she wouldn't be having, she wouldn't be fine in there, right? She'd be, so all of this I can spin, uh, no problem. Um, Hannah says that if she is subpoenaed for to Baldwin's trial, she will not show up. Well, you know how you guarantee she shows up? You hold her in custody. Because if she's still in a cell, you better believe she's going to be brought to Baldwin's trial. Um, the other thing is if she's on probation and she doesn't show up under a subpoena, then she's, there's an issue. And if I'm Baldwin's team right now, I am subpoena. <laughs> I guess they can't subpoena her yet because, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, they need a trial date first. I don't think they have one for Baldwin's trial. So, uh. I'd be trying to subpoena her as soon as possible and as much as possible. Uh, Mom says that she was held in jail for three weeks for contempt. Anna complains that she shouldn't be subpoenaed if Baldwin didn't show up for her. 
Uh, Baldwin didn't show up for her because Baldwin has a right not to testify about this because he's under trial. Um, the judge giving her time for no reason. Um, the reason why was because there's a, a person who died. Um, the judge isn't fair and they're going to the Supreme Court. Here's the thing. You're pending sentencing and the judge is going to see this and the judge is going to see how much you're smack talking the judge who now gets to decide how much jail time you have. Not fantastic. Hannah doesn't understand why the judge locked her up when she was on terms of release. Well, two reasons. One, someone died. And two, um, your lawyer barely tried. Like, he, he was not prepared. He was not ready. It, it looked like he was making stuff up as he was going, which was not, yeah... Anna says she's trying to get Carmela, Jason Bull's paralegal, to talk to the family of Helena about coming to sentencing to speak on her behalf. So she's not talking to the paralegal in this one, she's talking about it, and thus she is not covered by privilege or confidentiality. This is, this is a bad move. Don't. Don't. Um, this is the kind of thing you only talk to with your lawyer. Period. Full stop. Hannah talks about the friends she's making and how she's having fun. She says she doesn't want to go to prison for 13 months, but it is what it is. Hannah's saying she's having more fun in jail than he, the other party uh, to the call, did. Then Hannah says jail isn't like summer camp, but it's kind of like summer camp. Um, you might get some summer camp. Just, just saying. Hannah says that everything is going to get reviewed and that she feels like people were paid off to look the other way. Hannah goes into some sort of conspiracy theory about how she was used as a pawn. Hannah says it's not too bad in jail. Hannah complains about what was allowed at trial, what wasn't allowed. Okay, so there might have been inadmissible evidence. That, that happens. Um, in particular, they had an expert that they wanted to call, and I don't know if that's what she's mentioning here, but they did have an expert that they wanted to call. And that expert wasn't allowed because they didn't give enough notice to the other side. Because they didn't find this expert until the very last minute, basically. Hannah says that the judge is terrible, and Carrie got together with the judge, and they were against her. This is a very serious allegation of misconduct towards both the judge and the prosecutor. Not a good move. Hannah complains about how fast the jury deliberated. Hannah says that everyone who testified was given immunity, had a lawsuit pending, or was part of the problem. That might actually be true. <laughs> she calls the jury retarded. Not a good move. Um, when they uh, says a jury of your peers, they mean fucking retards. Again, that's Hannah's language. And for all the people who've been talking about her, you know, compassion and integrity and kindness, and she's not doing a great thing here. Hannah calls Carrie a bitch, and she's doing it out of spite. Hannah thinks, I mean, we've also heard she's had less kind words for other people as well. Hannah thinks the judge is getting paid off and thinks she deserves credit for being respectful. She is mad because she isn't going to get bail. Um, correct. Correct. Um, she says there's a lot of nice things about jail and that it is a forced break from life. Okay, she's doing good in jail. I get, like, these parts I got no problem with. She says that she paid a guy named Roger $3,000 to be her PR person. She says that Jason Bowles needs to talk to Roger to get everything out. Hannah and her mother joke about her mom getting thrown out of court and that the judge is a menace. Hannah thanks her mom for the outburst. Hannah was thinking that mom was going to be behind her getting booked into jail. Yeah, don't, don't support disruptions of court. Hannah says the judge was on a power trip. Mom wants to picket the court. Hannah wants to pull in the governor and fuck this bitch up. It's hard to know who or what she is referring to as the bitch. Um, that's probably a reference to either the judge or the prosecutor. Neither is good. She seems happy and is talking about cutting her friend's hair. Hannah's wishing they had hula hoops in jail. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Mom recommends writing a book about this whole thing before somebody else does. Mom suggesting cashing in. Mom is not being helpful. Hannah says that she's already been punished for this. Carmela, Bulls' paralegal, 
says that she knows Hannah's story. This one I have some problems with. Why are they listening in on a call with Bowles' paralegal? This one I would raise some issues with if I was Bowles. Um, Carmela says Carrie is lying about everything. They blame the child on set for being dangerous on set. Hannah talks about the kid getting the gun that was just laying on the ground. Why was it just laying on the ground? Carmela tells Hannah, I don't trust Carrie to not be recording these calls. I don't trust that bitch. Um, that's a problem for Bowles. Bowles should not have his paralegal talking like this. And also, you know the calls are, if you know the calls are recorded, why are you doing that? Oh, oh no. No, 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 no. Hannah says that if she has to stay in jail longer, that she's down for prison. Hannah says there's more to do in prison and talks about going to Springer where she could ride horses. So she's looking forward to that. Um, she might get to ride some horses. They talk about using her father's leukemia to keep her out of prison. They want to say that her and her mom are the only people who can help her dad. Hannah talks about her publicist and how it is time to make some statement from him. They talk about how it might work if Hannah says that she is the sole caretaker of her father. Hannah says jail isn't too bad and that some parts of it are just fine. They talk about Hannah can do that time standing on her head. So it's not a serious hardship. Hannah talks about her statement to the judge. Mom talks about the saying something to the judge and Carmela apparently told her that she can say whatever she wants at sentencing and the worst that can happen is spending a couple days in jail. Um, mom might not get admitted to the courthouse at this rate. Um, mom might get invited to wait outside for some reasons, including this. Hannah asks Carmela to reach out to Helena's husband and son to support her at sentencing. I can imagine how that conversation went. Something like, go word yourself. Hannah says jail is a forced vacation, that she's doing fine, and if she has to spend more time in jail, it'll be okay. Hannah says the jury didn't look at the evidence and are assholes. Hannah says the person, uh, the people that testified against her just wanted to talk shit and she got railroaded. Carrie lied in her closing statement. Hannah wants to go after people for libel. Hannah's mad that whole thing got pinned on her. Hannah says that jail is good character development. Hannah wants them to put Alec Baldwin in jail also. Well, you know, that doesn't happen unless you show up for court and to testify. Like, that would have to be something you'd have to do there. Um, the other thing is, your credibility is not going to be good. I'm just going to say you're not going to be the star witness of anything. Hannah asked mom to tell the judge about Thel's leukemia diagnosis and how she takes care of him when mom isn't there. Hannah tells her mom what to say about how she takes care of Thel. Hannah says the jury was so fucking stupid, again, quoting Hannah, and they couldn't tell what was happening. She calls the jury fucking idiots. Hannah says she doesn't feel like she deserves to be there and the jail guards agree with her. Hannah thinks the judge got paid off. The judge did not get paid off. That is a ridiculous assertion. And yeah, they talk about the call being recorded and how they need to talk about people by their names instead of bitch. And yet they continue. They complain about the time the jury took to deliberate and how they didn't look at the evidence. They talk about how she shouldn't be a felon and maybe they can get it knocked down to a misdemeanor. Hannah wants to bother the governor for the rest of her life so she can be pardoned. Um, I don't think bothering the governor for the rest of your life is gonna encourage a pardon. Hannah doesn't feel like she should be a felon because she's never been arrested. Hannah says the judge wanted to lock her up. Hannah and her mother talk about how the system failed her. Or, and maybe you should talk about how you failed, like you were the system to protect Helena Hutchins and you failed her. Maybe you should talk about that. She's having a movie ja night in jail watching Frozen. Hannah's boyfriend says that he's trying to quit smoking weed. Hannah says that she won't have anyone to smoke weed with and that she's going to smoke weed when she gets out. I mean, it's legal where I am, so I'm not going to judge too heavily. Hannah's mother says that Hannah should fight the biggest girl of the bunch that is causing problems. Um, If Hannah's doing well in jail, don't get into fights unnecessarily. Uh, mom suggesting that um, 
that Hannah commit criminal offenses while in custody is not a good look for mom. Mom says that she can't promise she'll be calm and cool at sentencing. Mom says she's going to go in disguise if they don't let her in. This is an excellent reason why they might not let her in. Mom says it's lucky that all she did at the verdict was yell. Is she suggesting that she's going to, like, do a Superman at the judge like that other person? Because that's a very bad idea. And, well, oh. Hannah says she got moved to 300 and it is fucking lit in here now. Hannah complains about the jail guards. Things are not going as well for Hannah, apparently. Hannah was accused of passing notes to some male inmate and sparked some sort of investigation. Hannah says she has Regina as a roommate and it is fun as fuck and not bad at all. So Hannah says that she's had a good day and fun with another inmate. Hannah says it is crazy good vibes today and everyone is having fun because they got their commissary. So lots of instant noodles to go around. Hannah talks about some new medication she got that made her loopy. She talks about working out. Hannah says she likes the new medication because it makes her feel high. She complains about the jury instructions and Hannah doesn't understand why she's there. Um, because somebody died. Just, just to explain it, somebody died. Hannah says that this whole thing has been a character attack on you. Um, maybe it's just been revealing your character. Hannah complains that she has all the fame of a public figure, but none of the benefits. Um, and she's, but there's been talk about her trying to spin the benefits. Hannah says, uh, this is all she's going to be known for. Mom asks whether or not Helena's friends and family are going to write letters for her. No. No, they are not. Hannah says she's nice and safe in jail. Hannah says that they, referring to law enforcement and the prosecution, don't even have all her supplies, so how could they pin it on her? And that is reasonable doubt enough. Um, could it be that they didn't have all of your supplies because you got access to the truck and took some stuff out? They talk about how much of Hannah's life they could take up, and that is uh, that this is messing up her modeling career. I don't think she's going to have a modeling career after this, but... Hannah thinks the producer should be in jail. That, that may be, as well. They complain about Dave Halls and how he fucked Hannah to save his own ass. Um, you got offered a deal, too. Hannah is dismissive of the judge talking about someone dying as a result of her actions. I don't know exactly what was said. Hannah talks about how she's in good spirits. Hannah says she's really fine in jail and someday she really likes it in there. Hannah says the prosecution bored the jury for nine days and when the defense put their case, the jury was bored. They think that the jury must have been tampered with. So again, alleging some pretty serious misconduct, they feel let down by the FBI. Hannah says that the whole thing wasn't so comical, she would be upset. Mom yells that Hannah didn't cause Helena's death, and Hannah agrees. That's not a great statement of remorse there. Hannah and her boyfriend talk about Hannah drinking and how she's mean to him when she drinks. Based on the timeline of the relationship, she had to have violated her conditions because there's another call where they talk about it being their six-month anniversary. <laughs> Don't self-snitch. Um, any conversation you're having on those jailhouse lines? Yeah. Um, this is really bad for any suggestion that she should be put on conditions instead of jail. Hannah says that she deserves a new trial and that this is bullshit. I mean, she's appealing. She probably won't win the appeal, but she's appealing. Hannah talks about her job at place and how she doesn't want her job back but maybe she does because she will need a job hannah wants to get on unemployment and she thinks that losing her job due to incarceration is the best way to get on unemployment so all of the stuff about how diligent she is and how much she's a hard worker and she doesn't want to be taken care of by anybody she's never asked anybody for anything whoops hannah says she should have signed the plea and then just gone on the news and denied it Anna says she's looking at 13 months, which is ridiculous over what happened. Um, you might be wondering where the 13 months is coming from, because that's not Harry Morrissey's position. I'm guessing that's probably what Bowles told her she would be looking at. And then she tells everyone else, so now we know it because she tells everyone else besides Bowles. Bowles' guess 
looks to be 13 months. Hannah thinks the paramedic should be in jail for intubating her wrong. Hannah says mom can also give Carrie two or three of her pay stubs to shut that bitch up. Hannah tells mom to get the ones where she has 38 or 40 hours, so it shows she has a full-time job and not the ones that show less. This is terrible because it also suggests that if she's willing to cook this information to the prosecution, how do we trust this, these letters and all of this, right? Hannah can't believe how many people are trying to ruin her. Someone died, though. Like, believe it. Hannah says everyone thinks it's crazy she got locked up with her history. Hannah says that she shouldn't be in jail because she has no priors. Hannah complains that they literally put her in there with murderers. Hannah says that people have accidents and people die. It's an unfortunate part of life, but it doesn't mean she should be in jail. She says the medic on the set of Rust is a dumb bitch and she and should have been prepared. They talk about the paramedics taking too long and she would still be here today if they'd done it right and not intubated her right. She calls the paramedics fucking idiots, fucking retards. Mom says, how is that on you? When you look at the injuries, I'm not sure she could have been saved even if she'd been shot in like the hospital parking lot or the hospital waiting room. Um, they were really serious injuries. Um, I don't think that there's a thing the paramedics could have done. Mom wonders if Carrie is going to be at sentencing. Mom says, she don't want to see me. Well, um, based on some of these statements, you might not be at the sentencing, Mom. Mom says she don't need that bitch there. Of course Carrie's going to be at the sentencing. Hannah tells her that they all use the same bathroom as the public and chuckles. Ah, I would love to hear those recordings. I wonder if it's possible for me to order those recordings. I'm going to find out if it's possible for me to order those recordings. Um, I don't know what the sort of public um, access to records is and so forth, but gonna find out. Um, so yeah, that is, that is that. That's a hell of a thing, right? Huh. So, I, I think Bowles might be right. Not in his position that he sent to the court, but in the thing of 13 months. I think that's not an unreasonable pr prediction. Um, I don't think Carrie's going to get the full 18 that she's asking for. Um, I don't think she's unreasonable to ask for it. I don't think she's going to get it because Bowles actually did a pretty good job. And especially those letters are on the whole, very helpful. I think Bowles is going to do, um, I think Bowles is going to move the needle with that, but we'll see. I mean, ultimately the big elephant in the room is the death. And it's very clear that the judge is that that weighs very heavily on her. The other thing to sort of consider on all of that is that, um, there, you know, when he's saying we want to put her on probation, if the judge was thinking probation, I don't think the judge would have ordered her into custody. I don't think probation is, um, I don't think she's looking at time served. I just don't, I don't see it. I could be wrong. You know, I'm a lawyer, not an oracle. I'm not a, a mind reader. I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not anything, but I don't think she's going to get that. Anyway, um, that's where things stand. And Monday, we will be able to watch the, um, the sentencing. I may try to live stream it or I may stream it later in the day. Um, I do my Monday night stream. It might be that we do a, um, a watch of the sentencing because, um, yeah. Um, that way I'm not competing with other people who are live streaming it. Um, you know, Emily and some others are live streaming it. It might be that we do a recap and a live stream at, or in a stream later that night. I still haven't decided. Let me know what you think. Um, there'll still be time to tell me what you think I should be doing on this one. Um, also I thank you guys for watching. I know this is a long one, but there's a lot of documents here and a lot of thoughts to have. So Thank you so much for watching. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Purple Dragon Air, PJs Forever, Canada's National Firearms Association, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. 
And then at the $20 level, Lindsay Metcalf, Larry Kalniak, Kyle Fox, Drunkle of the Baileys, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, Vicky, and Dorky Dane. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the call immediately following. Thank you for watching. Hope this armed you with knowledge. See you next time.